Welcome to this Houdini notebook tutorial. This video is part of the Terrain notebook. And in this video, we're looking at the Heightfield scatter node. Now this node is best used when you have some assets to work with. So I do just have a few set up, but this isn't necessary. So you'll still be able to follow along even if you don't have any assets. So I have this house over here. I have a few tree assets. They're all just very quickly generated, some bushes and some rocks. Now, the reason that I have this setup in this way is because the Heightfield scatter node is a little bit different from your other scatter nodes. The way that it works is in a hierarchical fashion. So generally, you'll want to be scattering your largest assets first. In our case, that's going to be these house assets. Then you're going to go down the list of what's going to be biggest to smallest. So then it's going to be trees, bushes, and finally rocks. Now, this will make more sense when we start working with it, but it's important to keep that hierarchical sense in mind because you'll see in a bit that it will allow you to do certain things like placing bushes underneath trees, right? So wherever we have trees, we can place some bushes underneath it. And that's a really nice feature that it has. And so we're going to go through that now and I'm going to show you how to use that. So over here, I just have a height field. I've just got a noise, a remap and an erode. So let's go ahead and say that we want to place some houses. Right, so we can use a height field scatter. So we can type HF scatter. And by default, you'll see that it places a whole bunch of these little cards. Now these cards are just placeholders. What they actually are, are just points. And if we middle mouse over here, you'll see that we now have 200,000 points. And the amount of points that we're scattering can be controlled over here by our coverage. So you can see that as we decrease our coverage, we'll end up with less and less of these points. And as we push it up, we'll end up with more of these points, right? So pushing it way up like that gives us 300,000 points. Now, scattering like this isn't going to be very useful. And you will see that the scatter method is by coverage using mask layer. We do have other options. For example, we have a total point count, where we can just choose exactly how many points we want to scatter. And we will be using that shortly. We also have a density using the mask layer, where as we push this up, we'll have a higher density. And this is just the density per square meter. Now we're going to use coverage using mask layer, but now this mask layer is very important for actually defining where we want to scatter. So we're going to use a height field mask by feature, and this is just going to help us generate a mask. So we plug this over here and we just end up with this by default. Now, where would we want houses? Well, we wouldn't want them in areas that are too slow. And so we can narrow this range in until we find a range that we're happy with, right? Perhaps something like that. So areas that aren't too sloped. So we plug this into second input over here and you'll see that it now only scatters in the areas according to our mask, right? So we take this mask into second input and it'll only scatter in the area where our mask is applied. Now let's go ahead and grab our house. So I'm just object merging it in over here and we're going to plug this into the third input. This is the primitive to scatter. If we take a look now and we zoom in, you'll see that it's busy scattering a bunch of these little houses everywhere, but this isn't exactly what we want. Firstly, there's far too many. So let's go over to our total point count using mask layer. And now we can choose exactly how many houses we want. Let's just do 30. Now, of course, these houses are tiny. So what is defining its scale? Well, this house that I've created has a uniform scale of one by one. It fits into a square of one by one. And that's just because we want a uniform scale of one by one to be multiplied by the range over here under variability. The range over here is the minimum to maximum size. So each and every point is going to have a random size somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5. And so we can increase this. So houses are going to be quite big. We can do between 10 and 15, maybe even 20, right? Now you will see something strange happening. And that is that some of these scatter points are getting the actual house and some of them are just getting the roof. And that's because this geometry that we're bringing in is made up of two pieces. You'll see that it has two pieces over here. It has a roof and it has the actual house. Now, when we output this, there's two ways that we can fix this. We can either pack this geometry before we bring it in to our terrain or on the terrain node over here, we just need to scroll down and just under define pieces, say single piece. What you'll see now is that each and every house is now a house with a roof. Cool, and so I'm just going to change this range a little so that the minimum isn't so low. So maybe between 17 and 20. Okay, cool. So now we have some houses. Now, all of this relaxation over here is just to ensure that our houses don't overlap. Because if we disable these, you'll see that, for example, these two are now overlapping. We relax these points and it prevents that. Right, so that's just something to keep in mind. All of those settings are related to the relaxation of points so that they don't overlap. You can see that removing self overlap does the same thing. Okay, so we're not gonna worry about that right now. What we do want to take a look at is just the orientation that we're giving these houses. 
So if we go over here to randomize up and randomize your, you'll see that if we do this, it randomizes the up axis or the rotation of these houses, right? That's not what we want. We don't actually want these houses to be aligned with the direction of the terrain. So what we can do is disable match normals with terrain. All this is doing is that it's lining up any geometry that we're instancing to the normal direction of our terrain. So now we have this over here. Now you may also have some issues where your houses are in these small little masked areas, right? We have these small areas over here and maybe that's not where you want your houses to occur. Maybe you want it in the areas that are most well-defined. And there's a cool way that we can do this. We can use a mask blur, so height field mask blur. We blur this mask over here until those smaller areas are much more subtle. And you'll see that because we're blurring, it actually maintains the strength of this mask over here. Now, something that you can do on the height field scatter is go up over here to the relaxation and we have a mask cutoff. All this is saying is any value below this amount, let's remove any sort of instancing that occurs. So if we push this up, you'll see that we only have houses being placed in the areas where our mask is highest, right? So you can see that those areas over there have high values and in there it has high values too. So now we only have houses in those areas. And again, you can increase the total point count and end up with more or less houses, right? Now, even though it's saying 63 over here, we're ending up with far fewer houses because it's actually removing a lot of them. If we go back down here to the relaxation, you'll see that it removes points, point removal method. Now, if we say only flag, what it'll do is it'll keep all of the houses that would be removed, but it'll flag them as houses that should be removed. You'll see over here under the geometry spreadsheet, if we take a look at our attributes, we have this RM flag, right? This is just removal flag. And some houses will have a value of one. That just means that those houses are actually not where they should be. So this is useful because you may want to remove them at a later point, or you can just remove them right now if you set this point removal method to remove. Okay, the last thing to keep in mind is that when you have a scatter like this, we should probably tag it. Now, tags in here are just useful ways to refer to a particular scatter, because if we scatter trees after this and bushes and then rocks, we need a way of referencing the correct scatter. So this one over here, we want to be our house scatter. So over here at the top of the node, there is a tag name. By default, it's $OS. And if you middle mouse on the tag name, it'll just show you the name of the node. That's all $OS means. So if we change the name of this node to something like houses, you'll see that the tag for this is now houses. And in our geometry spreadsheet, it all has the tag houses. You can ignore these few at the bottom that don't have the houses tag. Those are actually the volumes that we've created for our height field. If you middle mouse over here, that would be height, mask, sediment, bedrock, debris, and water. So those obviously don't need all of these attributes. So that's why they're kind of blanked out. But all of the points that we've scattered get this house tag. Okay, so those are our houses. Now let's go ahead and add some trees. So we'll use another HF scatter. And this is the cool thing. This node over here outputs not only the geometry that we've instanced, but also the actual terrain. So we can plug it into this height field scatter over here and it'll generate all of these points again, just like we've done before. An interesting thing that I want you to take note of though, is that around each one of these houses, there's actually a bit of a dead zone where nothing is allowed to scatter. And what that is over here is based on this outer radius of our houses. This is just sort of an area where we don't really want other things to be placed. So if we increase this area, you can see that each house takes up an area where we don't want things to be placed around it. And this is pretty useful. So for now, we're going to just reduce this outer radius back down. But having it like that will prevent trees from being placed inside of these houses. Okay, and now to actually place some trees, we can once again grab our mask over here. So you'll see that it only places in those areas now. And then I also have some tree set up. Now these trees have some weight attributes and I'm going to remove them so I can show you what it does. So by default, I just have these three trees merged together. In this situation, what I've done is I've just packed each one. This does help for when you're instancing. So we plug this into the third input and then we instance, right? And these trees are going to be really small at the moment. So we can increase their size to something like five to seven, maybe even bigger, we'll go 10 to 15. Now these trees are still quite sparse. So we can go over here to our coverage and increase our coverage, right? Pushing that up all the way. Then we also have the outer radius for each tree. As we decrease this, trees will be able to cluster more closely together because they're not having that area where they're not allowed to be close together. So now we have some trees and perhaps they are two all over the place. So once again, we can narrow in the mask by going over here to our mask cutoff and just narrowing in the range where we want trees, right? Something like that. So over here we have some trees and over here we have some trees. 
Okay, so now the only thing is I don't like the distribution of our trees. We have too many of the pink ones and those are just supposed to be like secondary trees. Now the way that we do that is by attaching a weight attribute to our incoming geometries. So we have three trees right now, but if we were to use an attribute create, we can go ahead and add a weight attribute to any one of these. So I'm going to add a weight attribute. So just change the name over here to weight. And this weight attribute needs to be a primitive attribute. Now you'll see that all of our trees disappear. And that's because the value for this is zero. If I set this to one, then we've fully weighted our green trees, right? So now we only have these green trees being placed. The way that you would adjust how the others are being placed is by adding weights for them as well. You'll see that if you have two matching weights of one, then it's just half half. Right? So matching weights will give equal relevance to each one of your inputs. So if you want to change that, you can set this to say 0 0.7 and this one to say 0 0.3. And this is now going to be 50% of our trees being these secondary trees over here. Now, as for the third one, perhaps we want far fewer of those trees. So we can just put this to 0 0.05 and then adjust this one to 2.5. So now 5% of our trees will be the pink ones. 25% will be these yellowish ones. And over here, we'll have 70% being the green ones. Now, how do we actually know which ones are which? Well, in this height field scatter, if we go to our geometry spreadsheet, it does something really nice for us. As you can see, we have this height field scatter one. Once again, that is the tag. So let's rather tag this with something that makes more sense, something like trees, right? So now we have house and trees. And if you take a look at the trees, there is a variant value, right? The variant value starts at zero and increases depending on how many variants you have. In our case, we have three types of trees. So the green ones will get variant zero, the yellow ones will get variant one, and these pink ones will get variant two. It's just based on the order of the merge node over here. And so that's how we can then control it. If we were to take this into a game engine, we could then replace them using these tags, right? So that's how we end up with variation in other pieces of software or when we're rendering out our final quality. Okay, cool. So now we have some trees and we have some houses. I'm going to show you a few other operations that this height field scatter can perform. If we just drop another height field scatter over here, it will once again place all of these points, again, avoiding the houses because of their outer radius. And I'm going to show you a different scatter method. Over here, we have per point count using source points. If I switch to this, it won't do anything. And that's because it actually needs a particular set of points to seed around. Over here, we can just enter the name of our previous tag, which is trees. And over here, it'll now only scatter points around our trees. And we have some options over here for the range and the distribution. This over here is going to control how many of these points we have. And this over here is going to control how far away from the center of the tree they can be. Additionally, you do still have this outer radius. So as you decrease this, they'll come in closer towards the center of the tree. And if you disable relax, then it will make sure that these come in as close as they possibly can. Right. So as we bring these in closer, you'll see that they become really compact around the base of each tree. What's nice about this is that we can just place bushes under the canopies of trees by increasing this source radius. So it pushes them out slightly, just like that. And then all we have to do is feed in our bushes, right? Just like that. So once again, this one has a weight attribute set to primitive to switch between the two types of bushes. And over here, we can, of course, make further changes to things like the size of each bush. We can have it range from 0 0.5 to 3. And just like that, we now have bushes as well. And of course, you can change the area around each tree in which they're instanced by pushing up this inner source radius, something like that. Cool. Rename that to bushes. And then finally, we can use another height field scatter. And this one can just be for our rocks. So perhaps this one, we want to use our mask again. So we can bring in our mask from here. Let's plug in our rocks. And just like that, we now have rocks as well. Right? So just like that, you can scatter a whole bunch of different types of geometry and you do it in a hierarchical fashion where you're working with the biggest ones first and then moving down to smaller and smaller ones. So if these houses were say hero assets, then what you could do is you could also mask out say paths between the houses. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do and then have no trees show up between those paths. And that way you can avoid having any sort of intersection, right? So you have loads of control over how much intersection you're getting. For example, on our height field scatter with our rocks, disable relaxed points, just like that. And you'll end up with points overlapping each other. Of course, you can also see that all of these rocks have similar rotations. So again, you have options for randomizing things like your. And because these rocks can be rotated under the ground without looking weird, you can also give them a randomized up vector, just like that and you end up with some really good looking results. Add some rotations to our trees as well. And there we have it.
Now you will notice that some of our bushes are going through our house. And this is actually an interesting thing where we've disabled the relax points. So it no longer respects the outer radius of our houses. Now you will see over here that if we have relax points on, it will move it away from our house. If we have self overlap, it allows our bushes to overlap with themselves. But over here, you can actually control how much of an overlap you're allowing with your house, right? Something like that. And so by controlling the iterations, you can control exactly how much it respects the outer radius of each of these houses. You also have an avoid point tag. So if we remove this, it won't actually avoid the house. And this is just in case it doesn't really matter if it's intersecting the house. And you can specify a particular tag, for example, houses, and then it'll work again, right? So that's all for the height field scatter node. This is a pretty complex node in terms of how much it can do, but it's really cool. It's very different to the other scatter nodes in terms of how it works in this hierarchical fashion and how you can weight certain objects so that the scatter is controlled in different ways. And over here, you'll see that we now have all of these different points over here, all of them being packed geometries. And if we go over to our geometry spreadsheet, we have tags for all of them. We have our trees, bushes, rocks, and houses. Right? They're all being tagged and they all have variants to them. That's all for this part. I do hope that this helped you. Um, this was a fun one to do. So I do hope that you enjoyed it and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Until then.